You know, many refuse to believe in Jesus and claim they, they just need more evidence. If they just had more evidence, then they could come to faith. But the reality is, the Bible tells us that it has nothing really to do with looking at the evidence. Rather, it really is an issue of the heart. Now, certainly evidence is important. That's how a truth seeker can know the difference between a truth from a lie. But people can see all the evidence before them and still choose not to believe. And faith in Jesus is not just about knowing the evidence. You must be willing to really see the evidence that's before you if it's going to make any difference. This was shown throughout Jesus' ministry on earth. We've seen how he would do miracle after miracle in front of a crowd. He would heal a person who had been crippled their entire life. And people would see that same event and walk away with very different conclusions. Some would walk away going, absolutely, that's proof he is the Messiah. Others would look at that and say, ah, oh, he's of the devil. So we know that true saving faith is never guaranteed in the response of even seeing a miracle, of knowing all the evidence. And we're reminded of that as we see excuses for unbelief in our passage this morning. These are excuses that were used in the first century, and sadly, they continue to be used today. And as we go through our passages this morning, if you find yourself using one of these excuses for why you don't believe, my prayer is that you will see the truth, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And it's only by coming to him in faith that anyone can find the peace and the joy that they long for in their soul. And if you'd like to talk to somebody about that further, please be sure and see me after the service. Now, in our study through Matthew, we've seen Jesus presented as Messiah, King of Israel. We saw how he came from the right family. He was born at the right time. He fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah coming. He ministered in the area that was foretold in the land of Galilee. He did all the miracles that the Old Testament had prophesied Messiah would do. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He healed the diseased. He cast out demons. He even raised the dead. He demonstrated over and over again he was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, the Messiah. Now, a few put their faith and trust in him, but most refused to believe. And we've seen how the religious leaders responded. They attacked Jesus despite all the evidence that was before them. They accused Jesus of doing miracles by the power of Satan. And that rejection marks really the turning point in Matthew's gospel. And for the remainder of the book, we will see the persecution starts escalating and the Lord's response to the increasing persecution and opposition that he faced in his ministry. We saw already at the beginning of this chapter how he responded to the Pharisees' attacks. He began to teach in a different manner. He began to teach in parables. And as we pick the account up today, we see his continued response. And because they rejected him in Capernaum, we're going to see that he moves on to a new location. Jesus desired to spend time with those who were open to coming to faith, not waste his time with those who had already rejected him. So turn to me, please, to Matthew chapter 13 as we pick it up where we left off last time in verse 53. Now, when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. After Jesus finished the sermon along the shore of Galilee that we've looked at for the last few weeks, he departed. Now, when it says he departed, this is a little bit different than the other times in which he left Capernaum. Jesus left Capernaum and would travel around teaching in the synagogues around Galilee, but this is a little bit different. Jesus was no longer going to use Capernaum as a base of operations. In fact, we're going to see he visits the town briefly later in chapter 17, but he's just passing through with his disciples on his way to Jerusalem. This departure is a change of the base of operations in his ministry. And it's as a result of their rejection that Jesus departed from that city. The Lord did not continue to stay where he was not welcomed. That was true during his earthly ministry, and it is still true today. The Lord doesn't push if people continue to reject him. He will give a person eventually over to the desire of their heart. And if a person hardens their heart, if a person continues in rejection to him... Well, eventually he will leave them be and give them over to their sin. Now, we see this often in the Gospels. Jesus would minister patiently. He would endure the tax of his enemies. But once it was crystal clear that a group was not going to have any faith in him, when they clearly had rejected him, he would leave and go elsewhere. 
In fact, that's what had happened at Nazareth about a year before the events recorded here in Matthew 13. And so before continuing in Matthew's account, we want to flip over and look at the account as recorded in Luke's gospel because it sets the stage for what happens next in Matthew's account. So turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 4. Now, as we look at this passage in Luke, we need to understand there are many different ways to harmonize the gospel accounts. You know, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different written perspectives on the life of our Lord. And while they often record the same events, each one also has some unique events in the way in which they record it. And in Luke chapter 4, we have an account of Jesus coming in to Nazareth. And some believe that this is actually the same account that we're going to read of in Matthew chapter 13. However, others believe, and I agree, that this is two separate events because there are great differences in what is presented between the Luke account and the Matthew account. And the Matthew matches with Mark's account. I think it's best to understand that what is recorded in Luke chapter 4 was a different visit to Nazareth. It took place at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the events of Matthew chapter 13 took place about a year later. And so we have two different visits to Nazareth and two different outcomes. And by looking at both of them this morning, we learn about the common excuses people use to reject Jesus. And as we begin in Luke's account, we see the first excuse that many people used to not believe in Jesus, and that is, he makes me mad. We see the reason that these people rejected Jesus is basically he made them mad. Now that might sound silly, but that's really what it boils down to. They let their anger, driven by their arrogance, blind them to the truth before their eyes. And so as we come to this account, we need to remember the, these events took place very early in Jesus' ministry. This that we're going to look at took place about a year before the events of Matthew chapter 13. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16. And he, referring to Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Now, we want to notice a few things as we start to look at this account. First is that Jesus came to Nazareth. That is where he was brought up. Archaeologists tell us that in the first century, Nazareth was a very small village, probably not more than 200 people. Basically, it was a few families that made up this very small village on a hillside overlooking the Jezreel Valley in northern Israel, in the area of the Galilee. And when Jesus came back here, it was back to a place where he was among people he had known his entire life. This is where he grew up. He would have spent every Sabbath in this synagogue with these people for years. In fact, this event takes place just after his first miracle in Cana. So it's only been a few months at the most since he stopped working as a carpenter in Nazareth. So he entered the synagogue and he stood up to read, which was not unusual. Visiting rabbis, visiting teachers, even those honored guests among the local congregation were often given the opportunity to read and then comment. Now, the scripture reading was done by a predetermined schedule. And so as Jesus reads here from the prophet Isaiah, you need to understand this was not some text that he randomly picked. It was one that was already set by a set schedule to be read on this day. And by the Lord's sovereign plan, he just happened to be here on this day to read this text. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now we're told he sat down after reading. Again, that, that was a tradition of the day. You would stand to read and then you would sit down to comment and teach. And he read from Isaiah chapter 61. Now Isaiah chapter 61 is a messianic passage. That is, it is a passage of Isaiah that foretells of the ministry and the life of the Messiah. The text says that the Messiah would be anointed by the Spirit, that he would preach to the poor, that he would give sight to the blind, that he would rescue the oppressed. That was the ministry of the Messiah that Isaiah prophesied in this text. And Jesus read that text, and then he sits down to comment. Verse 21. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, 
that is a very, very clear declaration to be the Messiah. No ordinary rabbi, no ordinary human would read a prophecy about the Messiah and then say, today the scripture I just read has been fulfilled in your presence as you hear me read. That is a statement claiming to be a fulfillment of the prophecy he just read. He is claiming to be Messiah. He was saying in a very Jewish fashion, I am Messiah. I am the one Isaiah prophesied about. You've heard me read it. I am this guy. I am the one who fulfills this passage. It's a very clear declaration here in this synagogue in Nazareth. I am the promised Messiah of Isaiah. Verse 22. And all were speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? Now, what we see here in this verse is it seems at first they spoke well of him. That is, they liked the gracious words falling from his lips. Everyone likes to hear about the prophecy about healing and rescue that Messiah is going to bring. That, that's good stuff. But then there's a switch, and they start responding with disbelief as they start thinking about what he just actually said. They begin to say, now, now wait a minute. Isn't this guy Joseph's son? Now, that is a, an attack. That is a statement of disbelief. They could not fathom that Joseph's son, the one they had watched grow up, the one who they had seen for every Sabbath for decades sitting there among them in that very synagogue, was actually the Messiah. They refused to believe the evidence that was before their eyes. They refused to accept that he could be the fulfillment of prophecy, that he really was the one who fulfilled Isaiah 61. And Jesus responds, verse 23, and he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Jesus knew their hearts. He knew the true intention of that question. That wasn't just uh, an innocent question when they start saying, isn't this Joseph's son? They were attacking him. and They were saying, there's no way you were really the fulfillment of this passage. They didn't believe. They refused to believe who he was. And so he makes a statement here. He says, you will demand what I did in Capernaum, I do here. You will say to me, heal yourself if you're so powerful. Because no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Now this prophecy was in part fulfilled at the crucifixion as people mocked Jesus at the cross. We read this later in Matthew 27. And very likely some of those from Nazareth were even at the crucifixion because they would have been there for Passover. We read this in Matthew 27. As people are mocking Jesus upon the cross, this is what they say. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. If He delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. That's the defiant attitude that Jesus saw in the citizens of Nazareth. And he warns them, one day they will mock him in the future. Now, when Jesus did return to Nazareth, and we're going to read of it in Matthew 13, after about a year of ministry in Capernaum, many would want him to do the same type of miracles in Nazareth that he had done in Capernaum. He goes on, verse 25. But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were cleansed, except only Naaman the Syrian. And Jesus now uses two examples from the scripture to show the truth that prophets were never welcomed in their hometown. And he's reminding them that being Jewish didn't guarantee a blessing, that they needed to have faith themselves. In the days of Elijah, he ended up going to a Gentile. In the days of Elisha, he healed only a Gentile of leprosy because those living in the land of Israel refused to have faith in the Lord. And if a person refuses to respond in faith, they will miss out on blessing. And so Jesus makes a comparison between himself and these great prophets, Elijah and Elisha. They both ministered in the kingdom of Israel. They both were ignored and rejected and persecuted by their fellow Jews. Both ended up going and ministering to Gentiles, and it was the Gentiles who were blessed. And so the implication of what he's saying here is quite clear to any Jewish person hearing him speak. Jesus has already declared himself to be Messiah. He is certainly one who is greater than even the prophets Elijah or Elisha. 
And if they left Israel to go where they were welcomed, how much more would the Messiah do the same? Jesus is basically saying with these illustrations, don't think you're safe. Just because we grew up together, just because we're fellow uh, Jews, if you don't believe in me, you will suffer. I will go to those who will believe, even like Elijah and Elisha did. And this is the response of the people in Nazareth, verse 28. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. The reason they rejected Jesus is because they were filled with rage. Jesus made them mad. All he did was speak the truth. But he reminded them that their bloodline never was a guarantee of God's blessing. That each of them needed to have faith in what God was doing. And faith in the Lord and faith in the Messiah. And that simple statement angered these arrogant men and women. Now notice, they had no clear logical, logical objections to why Jesus couldn't be Messiah. None of them start reasoning with him. Now wait a minute, you can't be Messiah because you weren't born in the city of David. There's nothing here going on that he could respond to. They had no scripture to back up their disbelief in Jesus. They couldn't show that he was lying. They couldn't argue that he didn't have the qualifications. They simply didn't want to believe in him. And so as Jesus spoke the truth, they got angry with him. And because he exposed their sinful hearts and warned of judgment, said that they could miss out on blessing, even as those in the days of Elijah and Elisha, they got furious. You know, if someone gets angry when the truth is spoken, that's the sure indicator of a troubled heart. And when people allow their anger to consume them, consume them they lose the ability for rational thought and action. The same goes even today. Oftentimes, people reject Jesus not because of the facts, but simply because of their emotion. They don't want to hear that they are a sinner. That offends them. They don't want to be told that their lifestyle is sinful. They don't want to give up what they like doing, their sin. And so when they hear of Jesus and they hear of the gospel invitation, they get angry. Now that anger makes no logical sense. But the heart of sin makes no logical sense. These in Nazareth were furious at what Jesus said. And their anger was going to drive them to attempted murder. Verse 29. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill in which their city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went on his way. These same people he grew up with tried to murder him out of rage. They were furious because he exposed their sin. He told them that faith is what pleases God, not their bloodline. And because of their rage, that was their excuse to reject him. Now, it sounds rather childish. I don't believe in Jesus because he made me mad. I don't like what he said, and so I want to kill him. But that's exactly what they did. And that's really what people still do even today. It's foolishness to allow pride and anger to blind you to truth. Emotions, anger, is never a good reason to reject what is true. Those who refuse to look beyond their wounded pride, beyond what their selfish arrogance told them, they would pay a price for disbelief. And so Jesus miraculously walked through their midst. They weren't able to harm him because it was not yet his time. And he went to Capernaum. He did not stay in Nazareth. They had clearly rejected him. Attempted murder, pretty clear indication they don't want you in your city. So he left. And Jesus went to Capernaum for the next year, and that was the base of his ministry. Now, we've been studying of his ministry in Capernaum in our study through Matthew. We've seen what he did over the course of the next year. But finally, those in Capernaum officially rejected him for basically the same reason they had in Nazareth. They, they were mad. Remember what we saw what the Pharisees and the scribes in Capernaum did. They accused Jesus of being empowered by Satan because they were offended by his teaching, because they got mad. And so, just as Jesus had left Nazareth, now he departs from Capernaum. He departed to go preach the gospel to those who would be more receptive. And so now, as we come back to Matthew chapter 13, we're going to see that Jesus actually comes and gives the city of Nazareth a second chance. He comes again to his hometown a year later. But sadly, his reception didn't improve much. And this time, rather than just getting angry, we see their main excuse for not believing is they argue, well, he's just a man. Look at verse 54 of Matthew chapter 13. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue. And they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? 
And so Jesus once again comes to Nazareth, his hometown. About a year has passed since the event we just read about. Jesus had been teaching, he'd been doing miracles throughout all of Galilee. Now certainly word of his ministry would have spread back home. This is not a large area. Word would have traveled very quickly of what he was doing and got back home to those in Nazareth. And when he arrived in Nazareth, once again, he entered the synagogue and was allowed to teach. Apparently, they were willing to hear him again. Despite what happened a year ago, they've cooled off. They're not going to try to kill him this time. They'll listen to him once more. And as they begin to listen to Jesus, they are astonished at what he said. That word astonished in the Greek is ekpleso. It means to be greatly astounded, to be amazed, to be astonished. It has the sense of becoming so astounded at something that you kind of lose your mind. You're just overcome with wow and wonder at something. They were amazed at the wisdom and the power that he displayed. And of course, that would have been the natural response to Jesus. No one ever taught with such clarity and authority as he did. No one had ever done the type of miracles that he was doing. Imagine watching with your own eyes someone heal your friend, someone who had been paralyzed from birth, and they just say the word, and your buddy gets up and walks. Or, or you watch a leper who you know has been deformed for years and suddenly in an instant his skin is cleansed and he looks like everyone else. Those would have been amazing, astounding sights, cause anyone to respond with wonder and amazement. And they ask, where did this man get such wisdom? Where did he possibly get the ability to do these miracles? They're asking, where did his power come from? But it's not an innocent question. Remember the accusation that had just been made against him in Capernaum? Right before he came back to Nazareth, the Pharisees said, Jesus, you did miracles by the power of Satan. And it's very likely that those in Nazareth had heard the accusations because this question is really very similar to that of the Pharisees. They're not suggesting that Jesus was of God because he had wisdom and power. Rather, they're asking, where else could he have got this power? This is a question of doubt and disbelief. Very different than what we see in the heart of Nicodemus. We read this in John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees, no less, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, what's amazing about that passage is we all know about the Pharisees. We've been reading about them. They weren't exactly a group known to be friendly to Jesus. But this guy knew, look, this power that he is evidencing, the miracles that you are doing, you have to be from God. It's clear that's where you are from. That was the only reasonable, the only logical conclusion. It wasn't to question the source of his power. It was to confess, you must be of God. But these in Nazareth sadly did not respond like Nicodemus did. They hinted by their question that Jesus was just a man. He must have some other source for his power and wisdom. It's not really a question as it is more an accusation. They are suggesting there's no way this guy's God, so where else could he have possibly gotten this power and wisdom from? And remember, this same group about a year before tried to kill him. And once again, they're confronted with his wisdom and power, but they still refuse to believe that he could be of God. And because of their unbelief and because of their hatred, they question the source of his power. They refuse to open their eyes to the reality of who Jesus is. And instead... This time they're going to come up with all sorts of excuses why he cannot be from God, despite the evidence before them. They start more questions, verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? His brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. They refused to accept that Jesus could be of God. And so now to begin to rationalize their disbelief, why his power could not be of God, they start firing questions, which really aren't questions, they're more statements. Is this not the carpenter's son? Now the word for carpenter here in Greek is tekton. That actually means builder, craftsman, or carpenter. It was a general term used to refer to anyone who worked with building material. Now, I know when we think of Jesus as a carpenter, we automatically have our mind that he's a woodworker, that he worked with wood and wood alone, because that's the way we use the term in English. But that was not the case for a tecton in Israel in the first century. 
the primary building material used was actually stone. And so when you think of Jesus as a carpenter, Jesus as a tecton, he was one who worked with wood and stone. He would have been really more like a mason. A carpenter was a general craftsman. It would do all sorts of building projects, whether it be stone or wood or, or whatever was needed. Now, remember, Nazareth was a small village. And when they refer to the carpenter, they all knew exactly who they were talking about. Now, at this time in the culture, most sons followed in the footsteps of their father uh, for a career choice. And Jesus would have learned carpentry from his father, and it would have been expected that he would remain in Nazareth and take over the family business from his dad. Now, apparently, that's exactly what he did for many years. Now, Joseph is never mentioned as alive during Jesus' adulthood in the Gospels, and so we assume that he had already passed by this time. And we know that Jesus had worked for a time in Nazareth as a carpenter, but he had left about a year before to become a rabbi. And now as he comes back to the city, not only is he a rabbi, he's claiming to be Messiah. And so this question, is not this the carpenter's son? That's meant as a derogatory statement. That's not really a question asking sincere answer. They're saying, now, wait a minute. We know exactly who you are. You're just the carpenter's son. You're nobody special. I remember you, you fixed my roof a few years back. I remember when you repaired my broken door. I mean, that's the sense of what they're saying here. Hey, Jesus, you're just a common, ordinary worker, just like us. We knew your dad. We know you. We've known you since you were a child. There's no way you're the Messiah. There's no way you were sent by God. You're one of us. No way you can be Messiah. And they continue along that line. They know his family members. Hey, well, look, we know Mary, your mother. We know your brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. Your sisters, they still live here. They're married to people in the city. We know your family. And so from this, we learn Jesus grew up with many siblings. He had brothers and sisters. They were all born to Joseph and Mary. The entire family grew up in this village. Everyone knew the carpenter's family. It also tells us that there had been nothing in Jesus' childhood that made him stand out from the other children. He didn't float around the playground and have a little halo above him or angels hovering above him to make sure nobody picked on him. That, that was not the case. Uh, he didn't do miracles as a child, despite what some people have thought. That's clear. Otherwise, they would say, oh, yeah, it makes sense. I remember when you levitated in the playground. Yep, you're Messiah. That, that's not what they saw. He had a normal youth, a normal childhood. He had worked in this village as a carpenter. Everyone knew him as such, and they knew his family. And they stumbled over that reality. They said, in essence, there's no way he's the Messiah. Now, look, we know your family, Jesus. You're good people, but you're not that good. You're not that special. There's no way you're Messiah. There's no way you're so special and God chose you over us. Now, that was simply an excuse for their unbelief. Where he grew up, the fact that they knew his family should have never kept them from believing the truth. Instead, they should have analyzed the facts of what Jesus did, seen the evidence before their eyes, and they should have responded with overwhelming gratitude and a sense of, this is amazing. God picked us to be the hometown of the Messiah. They were the hometown of the Messiah. That is an incredible blessing. Out of all the cities in Israel, that's where Messiah grew up. And you'd think that's what they would focus on, want to start putting up plaques, hometown of Jesus, the Messiah. You'd think that's what they would do. But their hearts were so far from God, they could not see the truth. And instead of honoring him, they rejected him and they mocked him. And once again, they took offense. The Greek word there for offense is skandalizo. It means to take offense. It's pretty picturesque. It actually means to be filled with disgust or revulsion. They were disgusted. They were offended by his claims. They were furious and incensed that one of their own, one who had worked beside them, one who had perhaps even been one of their employees and worked for them before, would now dare claim to be the Messiah. He was a man of common background, one who had no formal training, just a carpenter, the, the boy that grew up next door. And because they refused to accept that one from their own little town could be Messiah, they were offended at his words. Sad thing is, they weren't looking at this like they should have. They weren't focusing on the reality that his teaching was unlike anything else they had ever heard. It didn't matter to them that he was doing miracles that no one else had ever done. They hardened their hearts to the grace of God, and rather than humbly bow before the Messiah, 
They stiffened their necks. They defied God. They closed their eyes. And they insisted, no way, you're just an ordinary man. We know your background. Sadly, the same is true for many even today. There are many who read the Gospels and can conclude Jesus was just a man. They do not believe that he was God in the flesh. And they have all sorts of excuses to not believe what the Bible says. But the reality is anyone who says Jesus was just a man is doing exactly what these people in Nazareth were doing. They're allowing their preconceptions of what God can do, their own pride to dictate their belief. But that ought not be the way we are. We need to open our eyes to the truth of who Jesus is. Look at what he claimed. Look at what he did. He said time and time again he was the Messiah, God in the flesh, and he proved who he was by his miracles. And while certainly he was a man, we also know he was more than that. He is God. And Jesus responds to their questioning, to their accusations at the end of verse 57. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his, home, in his hometown and in his own household. See, these in Nazareth insisted because they knew the family of Jesus, there's no way he could be of God. Now, if you stop and think about it, that's really an absurd reasoning. There's no logic to it at all. The Messiah had to grow up somewhere in Israel. He was going to be uh, close with some city in Israel. Why not theirs? This was not a valid reason to reject him. They should have rejoiced. They had the privilege of knowing Jesus as he grew up. In response to their lack of faith, Jesus says, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and his household. He repeats basically what he said a year before, the hair being foolish, and yet pride often clouds people's judgment. You can understand a little bit because it's often difficult for people to accept someone they grew up with in a position of authority as an adult. That was certainly true of prophets. That's why this had become a proverb. A prophet was one who spoke for God, spoke with the authority of God. And for those who grew up with a prophet, it was sometimes difficult for them to accept him as a spokesman for God. They would remember him as a child, as one of the guys, as what they used to do when they hung out together. And oftentimes those closest to a prophet would struggle to honor him as they ought. But really, the fact that you grew up with someone should have no bearing on how you relate to them as an adult. It's foolish not to respect someone simply because you grew up together. And it was foolishness for these to reject Jesus because they knew his family. And yet that was the excuse they were using. They insisted he must only be a man. They knew his family. Now, that's foolishness. It makes no sense. No more sense than being angry at him a year before and wanting to kill him. Because of this, they missed out on the gift of salvation. And sadly, so many today still use the same excuse. And they miss out on the salvation that Jesus offers to all. Don't be like those in Nazareth. Don't reject Jesus just because you think he's only a man. And if you're sharing the gospel with someone and they respond in this same way, then patiently show them the truth from Scripture. Jesus was so much more than just a man. Verse 58. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Now, this does not mean he was unable to do miracles, but he chose not to do many because of their unbelief. It was not a matter of ability or lack of ability, but of choice. Jesus chose not to do many miracles here because of their attitude, because of their rejection of him. And their unbelief became a reason for a lack of blessing for the entire city. Jesus responded to those who had faith in him, but to the prideful, to the arrogant, to those who resisted him, he would withdraw. Now, Mark's account tells us that he did heal a few sick people, but only a few. So he still did a few miracles in Nazareth, and those few miracles would have been enough evidence for any who was truly interested to see his power. The reality is just one miracle of healing someone who was sick and in an instant they are healed is enough to confirm that he was Messiah. But Jesus did not waste his time among those who had already made up their minds to reject him. And the reason for the lack of miracles was their lack of faith. And because of their unbelief, they missed out on great blessings. Sadly, the reality is people today are still like those in Nazareth. They make these same excuses. Some resist Jesus simply because he makes them mad. Others resist him because they insist he's just a man. But really, those are foolish reasons to reject Jesus. Our emotional response should never be the determiner of truth. Truth is truth, regardless of how I feel about it. You know, I may be offended if you tell me I'm wrong, but my feelings don't change whether it's right or wrong. And most people don't enjoy being told they're wrong. 
but we need to speak the truth. And if you're sharing the gospel with a person and they become angry at you, don't be surprised. Remember, that's how they responded in Nazareth as well. And if you encounter that, I encourage you to follow the Lord's example. Back off if someone's starting to get angry. Wait for their emotions to calm down. And then come back to them again at a little bit later point. That's what we see Jesus do with Nazareth. They got angry. They got emotional. He let them cool off for a year. And then he comes back to them and he offers them the gospel again. Others reject Jesus, insisting he was just a man. But that's not a logical conclusion based on the evidence. And if you're sharing the gospel with someone and they argue, look, Jesus was just a man, then take the time to show them how Jesus was so much more, is so much more than just a man. He is God. He claimed to be God. His death and resurrection verified that he was who he claimed to be. Now, a person may still resist. They may refuse to believe, as sadly those in Nazareth did. But we are called to share with them the truth, even as our Lord modeled for us. The truth is, Jesus is Lord. He is the Messiah. He came to save all who would, all, who would have faith in Him. And so we need to pray for those whose eyes are blinded. And let us be faith, patient and follow the Lord's model for sharing the truth with those who exercise these same excuses for unbelief. And let us follow the Lord's example and show patience and kindness and love towards even those who would reject our Lord. <coughs> let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these vignettes of what took place in Nazareth so many years ago. Lord, thank you for showing us your compassion and your heart and your love for humanity. That you and your great grace did not immediately wipe out these who disbelieved, who acted in a sinful and vengeful manner towards you, who rejected and scorned you, the great I am, but you patiently continued to show love and grace even to those who would reject you. Thank you that you show, have shown that same love and grace to us. Thank you that you have opened our eyes to the truth that you are so much more than just a man and you are the one who brings joy and peace into our hearts. May we have your heart in dealing with those around us. Give us the patience to deal with those who respond in anger and give us the wisdom to know how to respond to those who question the reality of who you are. Thank you that you are a loving and a patient God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have showered upon us. Thank you that you came and endured the humiliation that you did as you walked upon the earth so that you could give your life as a sacrifice for us. I'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.